Welcome back. Today is the day. As this video goes live, Bobby Kotick's tenure at Activision Blizzard has ended. His final statement celebrated how proud he is of the work from the people that he brought together. But many of those people, understandably, feel very differently. I'm going to cover his departure and the changes that Xbox are instituting at the leadership levels of Activision Blizzard King. But, of course, how much is this merger actually going to change things from the ground up? Bobby may be going, but the culture and the decision styles of his board, those will reverberate for years, as is even shown by the latest monetization mess from Overwatch and allegations from a better ABK of a sly strategy of soft layoffs for QA staff, meaning it's business as usual for Activision Blizzard and for us with today's sponsor. You and I are going to polish up our goopy gamer brains and we're going to unlock some earning power with brilliant.org forward slash bellier news, where the first 200 to click my link will get 20% off the annual plan and they've got a 30 day free trial. So here's the deal. Brilliant is about interactively breaking down big problems into smaller ones that are easier to understand with their bite sized quiz based learning format that is across their app and the web. It all just looks and feels so good and slick. Like, as an example, think about the number crunching that goes into games. Well, what you could do is you could start to learn the fundamentals of computer science, a three part course that takes you through the pillars of the field. And once you've done that, you could say head up neuro neural networks and algorithms, and that'll give you an understanding of how so many things actually work. Through data science and maths, of course, you can learn how to process information and probabilities, and the brilliant thing is they're always adding new material, like just recently, how large language models work, and one of my favorites, predicting with probability, because seriously, probability seems like it should be simple, but then there's some really powerful yet a little unintuitive stuff that you can learn. And of course, if you're learning via Brilliant, you actually get the click where you know it works in your brain because they're taking the stuff that was not fun at school unless you had a total legend of a teacher and they actually make it exciting and interactive. So approaching all this as an adult, you know, I get a personal sense of accomplishment, boosts my day a bit. I, you know, feel like the cobwebs are going away. And of course, if I was learning, maybe prepping for a new career, man, that is exactly where I would be. And you can get started today where the first 200 to click my link, brilliant.org forward slash bellular news, get 20% off an annual plan. And of course, they've got that 30 day free trial. Okay, Bobby's gone and he's going to be taking with him a $375 million golden parachute and will be heading off into the sunset. He obviously released his statement titled Bobby Kotick with gratitude. He speaks of his first love of games coming from Roberta and Ken Williams his title Mystery House, adding that it's fitting that Activision now owns the company and that game. Though, funnily enough, it doesn't appear you're actually able to buy that game right now. He then goes on to marvel at the people of Activision Blizzard, detailing the transformations that they've accomplished in gaming between then and now, and then he talks up, of course, the future under Phil Spencer. So, all perfectly lovely words that pass the credit over to the people who have made these games. So, let's hear from some of those people who have made the games. As an example, Inverse took a statement from an anonymous employee who said, Bobby should have left two years ago when 1,800 of us publicly asked him to stand down, but better late than never. Working for Microsoft seems like it's going to be better in every possible way than we're used to. It's surreal. Clearly, that employee doesn't have a uh, large amount of gratitude going back up the chain to Bobby, but I do think what's interesting there is... Under Microsoft, they do appear to be a bit more uh, happy. Certainly, I've spoken sort of socially to some Activision uh, Blizzard King developers over the last while, and the temperature that I've been able to take certainly is one that you know, sort of says it'll be warmer under Microsoft, right? I do actually think for the staff that should be better. Now, of course, as Bobby goes, other people are going to go as well because Microsoft will find themselves with loads of duplicated roles at the higher corporate level. Kicking off the leadership then, we've got Matt Booty. He's basically performing the same role that he's now having over at ZeniMax. Essentially with ZeniMax, Microsoft kind of being known for a very hands-off strategy with their acquisitions, they were rather caught off guard taken by surprise with just how Redfall was. They were left essentially paying the PR bill for ZeniMax's prior very bad decisions, decisions that also led to the likes of Fallout 76, which seems to have been salvaged, and Wolfenstein Youngblood, which was a massive mistake. So Matt essentially is acting as that oversight, and he's going to be doing that as well 
over here with Activision Blizzard. As for the rest of the departures that were scooped by The Verge, we are losing Lulu, who was their chief communications officer, Hooman, who was the vice chair of Blizzard and King, and then Thomas, who was the vice chairman of Activision Blizzard. But more executives are going to be going in March. So quite a lot of people actually will be gone. Otherwise, then the biggest change is some of the remaining people, uh, Brian Bellato and Julie Hodges, they will be reporting to their equivalent people over at Microsoft Gaming, right? So these are essentially the people who will be key to basically managing the overarching like structure of the merger kind of integrating with Microsoft. So basically they're seen as being kind of key to the immediate operations. What does this mean day to day? You might be wondering after all of this corporate fluff. Basically, we can take a look at some decisions that have been made in their immediate games with Overwatch's winter event that is better, but still not good. Uh, that actually seems to have surprised the Overwatch team in people being a little bit miffed by it. Then also some changes with QA that are leading to accusations of basically doing soft layoffs. I will say though that these are definitely pre microsoft's large power structures actually moving in so these could be legacy decisions at the very least it does seem quite a lot of staff at the company do seem to be more comfortable under Microsoft than the alternative. Now then, the Overwatch event. At the time that this came out, we suggested the main value here was retention, right? Uh, basically, there was potentially more value for cosmetics, kind of at a lower price. That's basically how Blizzard tried to sort of frame this whole thing. But it's actually worked out a bit worse than we expected. At the time, we ran through the information for the event, detailing how it worked. It was basically a mini battle pass that essentially was for weeks long, kind of focused on retention, where people would earn tickets, then they could cash their tickets in for the cosmetics. But the rub here is that 120 tickets are available for free track players, and a further 360 are available for premium track players. Now, the premium track costs 500 Overwatch credits. That's the equivalent of five US dollars. Of course, you spend your five bucks, and then that gives you the opportunity to get more tickets. Being a battle pass, it can expire and your potential value will evaporate. And per the terms of the event, the premium pass will be required to get access to some of the cosmetics for purchase, and the tickets will be converted into Overwatch credits after the event ends, which at the very least means you don't completely waste them. So that's what we knew. Rather amazingly, though, it actually gets worse. Here's the deal, right? To buy only all the skins would leave you still needing more tickets because together they cost 590 and you can only earn 480. This obviously disappointed people who were kind of excited about a new way to get cosmetics as they were playing Overwatch over Christmas. And here's where it gets interesting, because responding to these concerns, the executive producer, Jared Nuss, heard the complaints, but uh, basically said that they figured providing players choice uh, was, was kind of worth it. It's kind of interesting, because he says here, it's five bucks for four legendary skins, which feels squarely in the spirit of holidays to me. I hear you on wanting to be able to unlock everything. We wanted to give folks choice in the rewards they got from the event. We'll be interested to see if FOMO overshadows that benefit. So that's just the thing. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter the team like wanting to make things better. They still have to do that within the framework of the game's business model. And that's a business model the players, broadly speaking, are not happy with because it's a straight downgrade on what they've been used to. In a way, it's not dissimilar to the Call of Duty map-based battle pass, where, of course, users saw, hang on a second, this is just a way for you to charge us way more and to do black cell. Call of Duty would say, but we're giving you options and where you start in the battle pass, it's better. That's just how it works. But that's actually not it because there is another way to get tickets. And this, I think, changes some of what Jared said because here is the very nice looking uh, Tracer skin, right? It's kind of like upmarket looking one. Now, if you buy the Winterfair bundle, you get this skin and 575 credits for the cool price of 3,000 Overwatch coins or about 30 bucks. And of course, Blizzard then are thinking that those 575 uh, tickets are of a humongous value because of the pricing of this winter fair event pass so it's bloody obvious what's going on here it's a little bit like a hyper monetized version of traders tender within world of warcraft uh yeah totally the reason why the premium thing doesn't give you more tickets is because they want you to buy this for 30 bucks and when you actually think about the intended money making behavior of the offering they're presenting i think what jared says here is not the full picture. It's five bucks or four legendary skins. Sure, but that's not all of what's going on here. That's not how the monetization has been designed. 
What you're talking about there, Jared, is the introductory experience to the broad monetization scheme that you're trying to do. I suppose if you're Jared or anyone of the Overwatch team who's wondering how some of this stuff that you think should be okay based on a tweet like that actually doesn't go down well with customers, I hope I've been able to explain that. They likely feel like they don't have much choice. I'll keep on going though. So that's uh, 30 bucks, that 3,000 Overwatch coins for this pack. That's actually 100 coins less than the Hard Light Weapon Skin Bundle. Yeah, remember the Hard Light Weapons? I think they were about 12 bucks each. Turns out there's a bundle that's basically all of those for essentially 30 bucks. So a lot of uh, monetization opportunities happening for Christmas, of course, which uh, is how the world works. Now, the response to all of this has actually reached Jared. Here's what he said, speaking to the Group Up podcast that's captured by PC Gamer. He explained the reasoning behind the decisions, then he admits they were misguided. So here's what he says. I'll be totally honest, the response has kind of surprised me. It's totally understandable when you break it all down like that. What we wanted was for players to have more choice. The goal here was, what if an event had a similar structure to what we have today, but you could pick the thing you got at the end? Again, he reiterates that they were excited to offer players more content overall through this than they otherwise would have got in terms of the raw number of legendary skins. Um... Now, of course, that's right. This is better than the previous offering. It's cheaper than the previous seasonal event skins, and it's a more engaging way, I suppose, of earning those skins. But ultimately, uh, you're still paying, still subject to FOMO. And the difference now is that when you do pay, you don't get everything, which then will make you want to pay more so that you can get everything because of that bundle. Come on, man. I cannot believe that an executive level person could be surprised by any of this. Uh, in the same interview, though, he does confirm the team have listened to feedback that they've, you know, they've heard what players are talking about, even in things like the uh, mythic skins, how the game needs to be up to there, because basically the cyber demon Genji was really good and they have absolutely seemingly be phoning it in. Now, I wouldn't say the staff are phoning it in. No, no, no. The staff are trying as hard as they can. Point is, there's a nine week season that requires all of this content, all of these microtransactions, all these bundles, all these everything. Can you imagine the amount of work it takes to actually get all of that? So no wonder with this going on for Christmas, all of the other spending opportunities that we've got, is it no wonder that the battle pass for this season is one that a lot of people have said is pretty weak, doesn't really have that much good stuff in it? Overwatch is a free-to-play game. It's going to be monetized like a free-to-play game, but Blizzard's problem is Overwatch didn't used to be one of those. So if Blizzard starts to, say, have literally a carbon copy of the monetization model of, say, a Riot game, Blizzard can't do that. They just can't. They, w they won't be allowed to. And ultimately, that's, uh, that's what happens when you handle Overwatch the way that they had. It's quite brutal because I think Overwatch, the actual game itself, really is quite fantastic. But again, it's, it's not just the free-to-play thing. It's also getting people's hopes up on PvE amidst the backdrop of completely fumbling Overwatch 1 and really leaving a lot of people like their investment, both sort of, you know, literally and emotionally in that experience, like that just wasn't worth it. So again, they're, they're kind of screwed. They're in such a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because I think there is a way of making players happy, but if they do that... At the very least, all leadership clearly would not have been happy. I wonder if Microsoft will be willing to have a bit of a softer model. I mean, at the end of the day, even thinking about what they do in Halo Infinite, in that game, the battle passes don't expire which is a nice touch. Okay, to move on then, they're being accused of soft layoffs. We've seen over 10,000 layoffs in the industry this year, which is a lovely big number, yikes. Uh, so we've seen that, but there are also more subtle ways of doing layoffs. This is published by the ABK Workers Alliance. Each of the QA teams hosted in Minneapolis, Austin, and El Segundo, they've had emails distributed to them November 30th, stating that the current model of hybrid remote slash on location work will be ending in January. People will be required required to go into the office. If somebody can't do that, they will be offered severance. Obviously, this is a changing of the deal from any of the staff, meaning they are not happy. Hybrid work, they say, was introduced earlier in the year instead of full remote work, um, and that basically already had some staff believing they were forced out from not, uh, you know, wanting to return to the office, especially when they had been attempting to get accommodations arranged, and those were either rejected or placed in the office. Now, you've also got staff being required to enter the office in the middle of winter, which for some who maybe, you know, have or like immunocompromised, for some who, um, you know, maybe have disabilities that could be an issue there, that's obviously not ideal. At the end of the day, if somebody's got, say, a compromised immune system, uh, yeah, it's, you know, be it like chemo, just, um, you know, immune issues that people have, 
remote like remote work for a lot of those people is actually really good actually allowed them to be uh you could even say more uh well in some cases even be participants in the economy in the first place so you've got that side staff have been given one month to confirm travel arrangements child care and all of those other things which of course whenever you've got to go full-time you may have to change this of course is happening in december which is already a hectic month for absolutely everybody. Uh, now, if people resign from Activision Blizzard, they're not being fired. They're just kind of being forced out because of a change of circumstances. That means no requirement to report layoffs as a corporate body. That means no reporting on those layoffs from the press, especially if they're spread out across the population over time. Activision Blizzard actually gave a statement to Eurogamer. They basically said that for them, full-time office work is key to the QA process. In particular, we saw our QA team in Minneapolis, Austin, and El Segundo work more effectively and efficiently in person and thanks to improved broadband speeds, seamless team coordination, and better hardware access. Kind of interesting. They say that they're focused on finding appropriate, reasonable accommodations for team members who experience barriers to performing their essential job functions and will thoroughly manage all requests and, uh, you know, all of that. They basically say that they've got a process for all of those things. But of course, while they say that, it may turn out that the definition of reasonable accommodations uh, as defined by staff and as defined by them may indeed be different. Overall then, what's my opinion in this? Well, pretty simple, uh, really. There's two bodies here. There are the workers, there is the company. The company is changing the deal for the workers. The workers are not happy about that. So is this a cost-cutting measure? It's kind of hard to say. I mean, you could totally see the accusation that they're making, but also it could be that they do have a belief that, uh, you know, remote work is not something that works for them or that hybrid isn't something that works. And look, if a company wants to say that, they're totally allowed to, right? They are totally allowed to. And uh, the way that it works is the jobs market is a market, right? So there will be other companies who will then gain a competitive advantage in the jobs market by offering those benefits. So ultimately then, will that be a net positive or a net negative for Activision Blizzard in these places? I don't know, uh, but they are allowed to do that. It doesn't seem that they're handling it in a particularly great way. And yes, indeed, that may cause uh, many staff to not want to work there anymore. And then there could be a short-term hit on the games that we play. So obviously, that will kind of suck for us. Certainly, uh, changes in QA can be very cha chaotic, even at the best of times. So uh, yeah, this is probably a short-term cell phone for something that maybe they, that they think will be better uh, in the, the medium to long term, but we certainly don't have confirmation of that. And uh, certainly for other companies, if they are willing, Willing to offer remote, then they can be more competitive in the jobs market, which is a market that's pretty damn tight. So there you go. That is it for today's news. Of course, big thanks to our sponsor for supporting the show. Check them out down below. With that said, uh, if it is holidays for you, have lovely holidays. Otherwise, have a lovely day and I'll see you next time.